Red Hood is one of my favorite characters. I've even got a tattoo of him right here. But one thing I've always wondered is, how did he train to become the Red Hood? If you think about it, he died and then Superboy Prime punched the universe and he became Red Hood. But there has to be something in between that. Today we're going to begin the story of Lost Days. We're going to put it into two parts, but it's going to tell you the beginnings of Jason Todd's revival from being dead and then his training. I hope you guys enjoy. Our story begins years ago at Raz al Ghul's mansion while he discusses business with his daughter Talia. As the two talk, Raz mentions that the detective's partner has been killed. Jason Todd is no longer in the world of the living. The ramblings indicate that it was at the hands of the Joker. And Talia stops asking, how is he? And Roz says, well, the boy is dead, crushed in an explosion in a warehouse. Talia tells him, no, how is Batman? Roz says that he is unharmed, but if you're asking about his emotional state, I would obviously have no knowledge of that. Don't act as though I am unaware of the feelings you have for him. As Roz walks off, he tells her that they will monitor talk in Gotham, but she must mind her work. She is not to reach out to him on this. As the months go by, Talia keeps tabs on Gotham, gathering any information on Batman and his mental state. However, one night she found someone else. Someone who looked like Jason Todd. As Roz and Talia watch from a control room, Roz says that he wants to see it. The young man before them was unresponsive in any way, except whenever he was attacked. When Roz gave the order, the men below began to attack Jason, and as a reflex, Jason knocked out each of them. After he was done, he returned to his unresponsive state, not even saying a word. The next day, Talia speaks with Roz, telling him that this man is half dead, received massive trauma, has flash burns from an explosion, and he was found wandering a road in a suit and tie. His clothes were dirty with soil, and he had dirt in his fingernails, which would indicate that he... Roz finishes the sentence, stating... He dug himself out of a buried coffin. Talia goes on stating that he is not a clone. Their blood samples match those that they were able to obtain, meaning that this person is the real Jason Todd. As Roz watches the doctors walking with Jason, he tells Talia that he wants her to find out how this man cheated death. Sift through every inch of dirt that he has ever walked on, and no matter what, the detective must not know about this. After speaking with a thug, he beat Jason with a crowbar going through the police reports, and even investigating the coffin that Jason crawled out of, Talia is nowhere closer to finding any answers. As time went on, Talia continued testing Jason, and the doctor watching over him says that his physical conditioning isn't an issue. It's his mental capacity. He's not improving. He doesn't respond to anything other than when he's attacked, which could be some form of muscle memory. Jason eats, he covers himself when he's cold, but he has no sense of the world. By now, they would have hoped to have seen his brain utilizing other undamaged cells, but he's not getting any better. Talia tells the doctor that he is wrong, and then she heads down into the room with everyone. She slaps Jason across the face and shouts, You will never fight her! So if it's just him reacting to attacks, explain that to her. After the testing, Talia takes Jason outside and tells him that he misses him. Since losing him, he has changed. He's become unforgiving. And in a way, she thinks that maybe him and Dick Grayson gave him light gave him hope. He feels responsible for this, feels as if he failed. He really does miss him. But as Jason sits there, he doesn't respond. And then Talia sees a single tear running down Jason's cheek. After bringing Jason back home, Roz stops Talia, telling her that this ends now. We've had the boy for over a year. We have no clue how he came to be. This whole thing has since turned into an obsession. Talia says that Jason is getting better. And in time, they will learn the truth. If not from research, then Jason himself. Roz tells her to stop. He knows what this is truly about, and no, he won't love her for this. Performing a miracle and restoring the boy to everything that he was, and then returning him to the detective? It will not make him love her. In the morning, we will be sending the boy away to be cared for and kept, protected and sheltered out of respect for his mentor and his present caretaker. As Roz retires down to the Lazarus pit, Talia thinks that... Tonight, they shall leave then. Centuries ago, her father discovered these fountains of youth, and since then has deemed that he and he alone will bathe in their waters. Jason was dead, murdered, 
buried, and mourned. But for him to return to this world is a miracle. Jason Todd was meant for something, and only time will tell what that is. She's doing this out of love and hopes that in stepping into the Lazarus Pit, it will guide him into what he is to become. A short while later, after learning what happened, Roz shouts, demanding to know where he is. I am to believe that you have taken Jason half a mile from the sanctum of the pit to a cliffside and hurled him into the waters with only a survival kit? How can you be so sure that the pit has not driven him mad? Perhaps not tonight or tomorrow. It could take weeks or months or decades. You have no conception of the power that you are trifling with. Jason Todd is an unknown entity. We do not know what force has returned him from beyond. And you have just empowered him with the nature of the pit. Elsewhere, as Jason walks throughout the streets, he begins to think. The Joker had murdered him, but he's still alive. The Joker is alive to hurt, kill, maim. Still alive to rob people of their friends and families. He has to know what he did, how he left him, how it felt, and now he's back and no one knows why. But he does. It's obvious. He's come back to do what needs to be done. Several days later in Gotham, Jason sits in an alley looking at the Batmobile. For someone to catch Batman, they will have to wait and put the time in. Which lucky for him, he has plenty of, thanks to Talia, access to some very fat overseas accounts. So to lure out Batman, one would have to set up a deal that even he couldn't ignore. Find the biggest fish that he could take the bait. All the while, Batman is off dealing with a fake setup. It's just to know how to deal with him. There are a few things about the Batmobile that no one except him, Grayson, and Alfred would ever know. It can sense thermals, air currents, and even has video recognition. But even there are chinks in the armor. For example, this wetsuit is made of a high-end seal work, invisible to thermal, and has reflective fibers, which happens to play hell with video. So to do this, you would have to be slow. Five seconds per inch slow. But still leave plenty of time to plant the bomb and make it out before Batman gets back. As Jason finishes up, he heads into the abandoned apartments overlooking the alley, and he waits for him to return. While he watches, he thinks, how hard could it have been? Just kill the monster that took me away. The truth is that Batman never really did give a damn about his Robins. He was the one that made this happen. He has no one else to blame but himself. As Batman returns to the Batmobile, Jason gets ready to press the switch, and he decides not to. Later, Jason tells Talia that it's not what she thinks. He didn't lose his nerve. He just couldn't let him go so easy. He would have never known what happened or why. Batman would never know that it was him. So instead of killing him from the shadows, he will face him. He will kill him with his own hands. Batman will see his face just before he's taken out of this world. Jason then turns back asking, will you help? And Talia tells him, of course. But in her mind, she thinks back to what her father said and says that he was right. She has unleashed a curse upon this world. Later, and with Talia's connections, Jason meets with the German known as Egon. He loves ska music and drinks a disgusting cherry-flavored energy drink all day, and he murders people for a living, and he's teaching him how it's done. He brings down a man, and he says, that's good, now how would you finish him? Jason puts his foot to his neck, and Egon tells him that the neck is thick and might not give. Jason then says that if he puts his full weight behind it, maybe, but he is also knocked out, so he could always stomp on the bridge of his nose and get into his brain pan. Egon says, fair enough. But you're still stupidly going for the head and not the eyes. Getting angry too easily will just waste and show that you're an idiot. As the two walk out, Egon mentions that he may have broken his ribs in there. Derek will escort him into the city to get some x-rays. Jason tells him it was probably just a bruise, and Egon stops him, telling him that he pays weekly. If he punctured any of his lungs and dies, he loses his fee. So go to the town. Days go by as Jason continues his training, but one night after returning, Derek asks, What's your story? How does some kid have enough money to buy time with Egon? Jason brushes off the question and he tells him that he always invested wisely. And Derek goes on telling him, Yeah, everyone has their secrets. But I've been watching and I can tell you're good. That's why me and another guy have been talking. Maybe we can get you some work with us. Before Jason can answer, he listens and hears footsteps coming, but not coming for him. So it's best to just watch. Seconds later, Egon kicks Derek in the back and then again in the face. After he falls, he goes stomping on Derek's face and then he tells Jason that he will forgive him. Some of his men forget that they have to refrain from discussions. Jan will take him back to his room now. As Jason gets into the truck, he notices two trucks off in the distance and he hears whimpering. But not the whimpers that dogs make. After staying with the Germans so long, Jason has learned their patterns and when people are watching him and when they are not. And right now he only has two hours to figure out what's in those trucks. As Jason jumps out of his window, he remembers Egon mentioning something about the west side before being brought back. 
so he decides to head down the west road. After sneaking down the snowy roads, Jason finds the west side compound and he sees trucks from before, and then he moves in closer. When he looks into the window, he sees the trucks were moving children, and by his count, there's 42 of them, all drugged, all undernourished. Jason then looks back at Egon's office and he sneaks in to look through any paperwork as to what he could be doing. And once inside, Jason finds a ledger. And though he's been writing in code, Jason can make out numbers. Big numbers. This is a slave trade. Egon is selling those children. And as Egon's men start to load the children back up into the truck, Jason says that it's going to take them about 45 minutes before they can get on the road and move out. It will leave him plenty of time. After finishing loading up all of the children, Egon's men drive out. But before they can get any farther, they find a flaming truck in the middle of the road. The passenger shouts to the driver to turn back, but as he finishes his sentence, the driver is shot in the arm. As the passenger leans back up, he feels a gun being pressed against his head, and Jason tells him that he is bleeding out through his shoulder, so he can either drive or take a bullet. His choice. A few hours later, Egon returns to the office, shouting on the phone that they are two hours late. Find out where they went! But back in the office, the door opens, and Jason tells him, It's okay. I got them. And he fires a shot into Egon. Egon ducks, and then he tackles Jason outside, shouting and asking, What is he doing? Egon then slams Jason into a tree, and Jason tells him, It's cute. Your accent gets thicker when you're pissed off. Then Egon headbutts him and throws him to the ground, shouting that he can beat him. He taught him how to fight. And Jason tells him, No, you can't. That's why I poisoned your energy drinks. Egon stumbles back as he begins to foam with the mouth, and then he falls to his knees motionless. Some time passes, and Talia meets with Jason and tells him, It's funny. She finds him a teacher, and he murders him. Jason tells her that murder sounds fancy. He didn't orchestrate whacking him over inheritance. He was a killer for hire, and he made extra money selling children as sex toys. So tell him that the world isn't better off without him. Talia smiles, and Jason asks, What's that for? And Talia tells him, Nothing. It's just that you're learning. And that was Lost Days Part 1. Now, like I said at the beginning, the entire origin of how he actually came back to life is Superboy Prime. You see, they're not going to explain it in the comic, because what actually happened was during one of the crisis events, Superboy Prime got mad and he punched reality. Punching reality shattered various things within the DC continuity, allowing for DC to basically use that as an excuse as to how certain characters came back to life or things were changed. In the case of the Red Hood, Jason Todd was brought back to life in a somewhat zombie state, and Talia helped train him to become the hero that he is now. Well, anti-hero. If you want to see the Under the Red Hood storyline in its own playlist, that is right here. And if you want to see more from DC Rebirth or anything that's currently going on in DC, I'm putting that link right here. And of course, if you do like the way we do our videos and you do enjoy watching my smiling face, please subscribe. We would appreciate it.